guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I'm really excited about today's guest, Sterling Griffin. He is uh, he's got a tremendous story, comeback story about resilience. Um, he's going to talk about all about finance, real estate, and he's got a fantastic story to share. Um, Sterling, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here, man. Happy to hang out with you and and our friends and the that are getting us in their ears right now. Tell people about your backstory, how you got started, and we'll get into it. Sure. So, when I started my first company, I was actually homeless. This was a little over seven and a half years ago, and I was in that position because I had gone through a very tough mental health spell. I had become depressed. This was after. I'd realized that my previous career as an evangelical pastor was not going to work out for me. That that I needed to that I needed to you know move on outside of the church. And so I became I got into a dark place. I ended up moving into my car, my Honda Accord. But that's when I discovered personal growth. I discovered mentorship. I discovered the ability to learn from people that were ahead of me. And I did that by first going to see Tony Robbins at his seminar, Unleash the Power Within. So have you ever seen Tony before live or or seen his tapes or anything like that? Yeah. 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 I've, uh, yeah, I've actually unleashed the power within Day with Destiny, uh, just shaping out your future, your map, um, business mastery. I think those those are the big ones. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, that's you've been to all the all the must see ones. Then. So I went and saw him and after that event, my depression was gone because I got into action towards a believing that my dream of helping people and earning a great income from it, building a great life from it was not only possible, but was just on the other side of consistent modeled action from people that had already achieved what I wanted. So at that first company where I was actually a health coach, I became a millionaire within two years from that time. In the first five months after I saw Tony, I was still homeless. But then in the next roughly 18 months following that, I became I became a millionaire. So I continued to grow that company, which eventually transitioned into doing business consulting for trainers and gym owners, health professionals that don't have a doctorate, like the people listening here. Um, I helped several people become millionaires. Many more earn between six and seven figures. And then I sold that company at the end of 2020 and for multiple seven figures. Now, once I did, I had a problem that a lot of people face when they have their initial level of financial success. I felt rich, but I wasn't free. Mm. There's a big difference there where you can have cash, you can have money, but not have real freedom with how you think, with how you spend your time, with who you spend your time with, or with what you do. And so that's what led me on a journey of learning about investing. Prior to that, I had not invested in any properties, in any companies, nothing. But since starting that journey over, I guess it's a little less than three years ago, mostly through investing in medical real estate, Specifically, uh, I grew my net worth from about three million at the time of my exit to eight point two million in the last two and a half years, and this is specifically by investing in value add medical deals. So I think quite a few doctors, especially if they've been around, they've been looking at passive income sources, or may have already started to generate some of themselves, some for themselves. They might say have started building some of that with multifamily investments because that's what most doctors are made aware of. Um, and of course, you'll you'll be able to tell me more about what you do or what your people do. But I just realized that medical is is such a 
is such an amazing asset class on the real estate side that most people don't know about. It's still kind of under the radar a little bit, but just as doctors are now more in demand as professionals than they ever have been in American history. There's just not enough doctors to meet the demand for hospitals or for private practice. There's just not. They just need more of them. In the same way, medical real estate is very low on the supply side, but very much in, in the demand side. So that's a little bit about my background, how I got here. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, I love this idea of uh, rich versus free. And yeah. uh, that's that's so powerful because uh, a lot of doctors, they have these high income, but they can't walk away. Uh, if they were to quit today, they, you know, they'd be broke very soon. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about medical real estate, which is a really fascinating class. Um, what makes medical real estate different from commercial real estate? Mm. Well, medical real estate is just for a point of clarification, it is in the class of commercial real estate, but it is it's often not talked about in that class. Most people, when they think of commercial real estate, they might think of multifamily real estate, apartments. They might think of office. They might think of industrial buildings. Those are some of the more popular types that people talk about or know about. Yeah. But medical real estate, I like because A, it's all triple net investing. And any doctor that has a lease will know this, that- yeah. They almost exclusively are paying for their own property taxes, their own insurance, and their own maintenance on their on their property, and they pay rent on top of it. Well, that's tough when you're the the tenant. It's it's pretty great though when you're the landlord, where <laughs> it truly is passive. It, it, it truly is like set it and forget it, mailbox money, so to speak. And the reason why I like medical is because while other asset classes, again, just using or the, the more commonly known of apartments invest, those on the high end, you're going to see returns where every five years, you can maybe with a great operator, double your money. Okay. So you're going to make about 20% per year on your money. What that translates to is if you give $100,000 in the next five years, you're going to make two, you're going to have $200,000. And that's great. I mean, that's amazing. Like, again, because you're not working for that. Right. But on the other hand, if instead you can invest in an asset class and a type of property that you understand a little bit better because you're a medicine practitioner, so you'll be able to see and, and, and know things that maybe other types of service providers, maybe other types of entrepreneurs won't have as competitive knowledge advantage as you would as a doctor, then you're able to find ways that you can earn 30%, maybe even 35% of your money. So my average investment just speaking for me, for, for what I've done, um, is over 40% per year on, on my assets. Now, I want to qualify that and say that that is, A, that's even with rates being raised so much in the last year where it's harder to find good deals. That is with the rate increases. I'm still making 40% per year on my money. Whereas like most people, they only make money when rates are low, when rates are very low. For Maybe people that are still kind of learning about finance, it's it, it's become a very different environment to buy real estate um, over the last 18 months than it had been in the previous 15 years. So a lot of people got you know more financially free. They started to build more wealth, but they did it and, and they got richer just because rates were low, just because they were kind of lucky and when they started investing. But what you see now is that you got to be very savvy in the world that we're in today, where there are more traps laid out for investors, you got to be careful. And if you're not careful, and if you're not working with good operators, you know, it can be a harder time to not just make money, but it can be a hard time to keep the money that you invest in the front end. So something I tell people to be very, very aware of, but all this to say, two things that are important for me, Chris, and it's a investing in medical, it's where there's just fewer people that understand it. And when something is not well understood by a mass market, that means that there's more opportunities for the people that are in now to make a higher return. Multifamily, in contrast, was amazing 10 years ago. It was amazing. Fewer people understood it. Fewer people invested in it. Or this is just any other type of commercial real estate. But over time, as more people got into it, it becomes more competitive. The returns for everybody go down. Medical will be like that in five years. But today, it's not. It's still sort of green pastures, more or less. So that's important for me. And then B, development. Development just means that I'm able to purchase a property 
I'm able to do construction on it, have a great construction team. Then I have a new tenant, a medical tenant move in, whether they be an urgent care tenant, an emergency room business, maybe they're a surgery center um, franchise or corporation that wants to move into that new location. So I'm doing all the work. I'm doing all the construction, making the property more valuable. They move in, sign a long-term lease, 15 or 20 years. And then either me or my investors will either sell that property on the open market for, for more than obviously what it costs us to build, or we just keep the process, keep the, keep the building and, and collect, collect checks from it every month. So I have, and the properties that I've done so far, I have some that I kept and some that I sold on the open market and it'll always be that way. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, I, I know the answer, but, uh, the question a lot of the viewers have is you hear about, um, especially with, uh, in healthcare, you know, a lot of hospitals are folding, closing, uh, they can't pay their bills, you know, healthcare margins are thin. What is the undiscovered opportunity in medical buildings, you know, with this trend? Mm. Well, the thing that you have to be aware of when you're selecting a tenant with whom you're going to do business, who's going to fill out your property, right? Who's going to be the tenant paying your rent for the next 20 years, 15 years, whatever. And there's a couple of things that you have to be aware of. First of all, what's the financial state of that particular business? And by that, I don't just mean how much money are they making per year? What I mean is more specifically, how much cash do they have on their books right now? Because the biggest reason why medical networks, whether they be hospitals or this is most commonly happens with freestanding emergency rooms, by the way, what you're talking about is where they yeah. run out of capital and they got to shut down hospitals. It happens less because hospitals can actually bill more to the insurance providers than the emergency rooms or the standalone urgent cares or primary care physicians like they can only bill so much when it comes to to a particular service, but hospitals, for whatever reason, this insurances do that, they allow them to build more, sometimes twice as much for the same service. This is all not going to be new information for the audience <laughs> here. So, so again, for the, for maybe if anyone doesn't know, that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> and, um, so you have to know when, when you have insurance being the primary way that you collect your, your income, it's different than in other industries where if you're going to invest in a tenant, you got to know if they don't get paid by their insurance provider for nine months at this new location or 12 months, because that's sometimes how the insurance companies do it. They just push out when they're going to pay you back. Then that is a company, especially if they're expanding quickly, that they can be in trouble, right? They got to be able to burn through cash and still keep providing their service month after month and still be able to pay that pay that rent to you. So that's why I work with a companies with strong cash positions and then also B healthcare entrepreneurs. So people that have already built and sold, built and sold being the, the critical piece, healthcare companies that are now starting a new healthcare company. So for example, one of my tenants, he has built a portfolio of urgent cares and emergency rooms over the last 10 years, or I'm sorry, not even shorter time. He started in 2016, was the CEO till he sold out his shares in 2021. And in that period of time, he took it from zero to 80 million a year in EBITDA. Okay. And then sold out his shares to then start a new company that's doing the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> because his previous partners didn't want to grow and take the new healthcare company public. And that was his intention. So because they're a little bit older, they just weren't interested in like a big company growing and scaling and selling a big company. So he sold out his shares, started the new company, and then boom, within the last two years, I kid you not, 2021, the beginning of 2021, he sold his shares. The last two years, he's already got the same number of locations open operating as he did in the previous five years with the previous tenant, with the previous company. So he's a guy that, you know, yeah, you count, he's got great cash position, of course, from his exit, but then B, he's a guy that's built and sold this type of company before. I just trust him. I trust him that he's going to find a way to pay his bills, right? When it comes to <laughs> the leases that he has with me. So this is one example. Yeah. What's it, what's interesting is uh, this process that you're describing, if you can do it quite well and uh, you uh, become an attractive acquisition for private equity. So kind of talk about how you could potentially exit, you know, get acquired by a private equity or, you know, a lot of private equities buying um, emergency rooms, urgent cares, all of that. Happily. So, I'm here talking with you, Chris, and you know we're obviously talking to your audience. We're talking to them. Some of them are like, hey, you know, I want to invest. I want to buy a property. I want to buy a portion of a property or whatever. That may be on their mind. And most of where I get my capital from is from investment banks. It's from 
um, institutions, larger institutions. Like right now, for example, I'm in partnership with an investment bank to raise 200 million for a whole medical portfolio of, of medical real estate, where across the different tenants that I've already worked with and bought properties from, done development for, they're going to bring in institutional money of 200 million. That'll be about 150 million will come from debt. So either private lenders or bankers, and then 50 million will come from equity, which will come from the actual investors with me. And so um, that group is going to want to buy a ton. And then over the next three to five years, develop it out, improve it, probably add more on top of the 200 million because I can deploy that in about 12 months into properties. And then we roll up for a much larger exit once all the construction and development is done in three to five years. Okay. And depending yeah. on the type of institutions that I get on with me, what I'm, what my real preference is, is I build and sell. That process takes about 15 months. I get about a 35% annual return when that happens. Then I just do it again over the next 15 months. Take the same amount of money, reinvest it, boom, make another 35% over the next 15 months. Boom, do it again so that in five years, I can do four exits. I can do four redevelopments and just this way I can take what starts as an initial amount of capital, which is not small, 200 million. But then by the end, it becomes and 20 million that I've reinvested to have a much larger exit by the end. So anyway, I say this because some people will think that, um, you know, I just want to invest my money in one deal and I'll just wait it out over five years and I'll take my what will by the end be 15, 16, 17, 18% return annually. Well, if you do it this way and you just develop and sell, develop and sell, develop and sell, then you start getting much greater returns because you're able to move through transactions much more quickly to add the value and sell it, add the value and sell it. Because the greatest pop to the value, I'll just finish with this, Chris, if you don't mind me <laughs> kind of carrying on. The greatest pop to a valuation that you'll have in real estate is when you are focused on upgrading the property physically. Okay. Or you are upgrading the property with a new agreement with a tenant coming on. They're signing on that lease. They're moving in. They're going to be there for 15 years or 20 years. That's when you get the biggest jump in valuation. So my model is built around how do I get as many of those big jumps as I can over the same period of time that while maybe somebody else does one property with their five years, I can do five properties with the same amount of money or four properties with the same amount of money in that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, it's, uh, you know, what you're talking about is smart capital and just leverage and, um, using, uh, this, this, this is how you build wealth and build financial freedom. One question is talking about, you know, that for the doctors listening is, um, should, you know, doctors are all about real estate because of the taxes. Yeah. Right? Thank goodness. <laughs> I'm sure well, you talk about that all the time. And it's like, one of my favorite things is like, Hey, it's great to make money. But are you saving the money on your biggest expense right now with taxes? Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but uh, which is better, investing in real estate, buying a business, doing your strategy? It kind of, kind of elucidate that for us. Yeah, I think that there's what's wonderful about wealth building is you can do that so many different ways, and there's so many different ways that are great. For me, I don't think that anyone should only invest in one thing. I think they should have diversification. So for me, I invest in companies as well. I invest in, for example, one of my things I invest in is an options trading fund. I have somebody that I know that does a great job with this. He just trades in and out of positions. And I mean, my money with him is a little bit higher risk, but he makes me about 50% per year on my money, 50 to 60% per year. I love that. That's great. Okay. And it's, and that's another form of passive income to me. And I, I, I mean, I don't sell for like several years, but that money is working for me in the background. So that's one way you can make money. That's what I call venture investing, venture style investing. This is where you're putting your money in and then it's a little bit higher risk, but it can yield an amazing return that can be somewhat life-changing for you. The second type is shelter investing. This is where you're investing primarily to save on a different expense that you have and or just to preserve your wealth. So this would be maybe investing in something that is going to save you on taxes, for example, right? Because most people, their taxes are at least 33% of their expenses or 33% of their money gone to pay for it unless they you know, buy something like real estate and use tax deferrals and cost tax and all that. But another way that people will often do shelter is like money that you can absolutely totally forget about and then you just put it into, let's say, an index fund. Okay, So you're just going to mirror the top performing companies, the stocks over the course of several years. You're going to make your 8%, 9 10% per year 
but you know you're going to keep that money. You feel confident. If you believe in the American economy over time, then you just believe, okay, I'm just going to put my money in there and forget about it. So that's great. A certain portion of your, your portfolio should be there. I believe that. But then there's the this middle section, which is called booster investing. And this is where you're going to kind of be in between the venture where it's high risk, but amazing returns. And then the like more, not zero risk, but very, very low risk on the shelter side. And that's where you're going to be able to establish these 25, 30% returns where you make sure that you check the operator, you do your due diligence. But this is where I expect that most people are going to put that kind of most of their wealth is going to be in this section. It's where I put most of my wealth is where I understand an asset class very, very well. I do most of my due diligence, most of my research, most of my learning is here. And it's not and because I learned so much about it, I'm able to minimize or mitigate the risk that I would otherwise have if I was just putting most of my money, say, in venture investments. Because on most of the money that I put in venture, let's just be clear, Chris, I don't expect most of the things by the numbers to all work out. I expect most of them not to work out over time. But a small number of them are going to do so well that it's going to take care of it. It's going to take care of all the money that I would lose on the other deals. But most of my wealth is actually going to be built in this booster section it's where I can put money in, I can add value, I have my focus on it, and then I'm able to turn that money over, over, and over, and over, over the next decade. Mm, I love that. And that's exactly what um, Tony Robbins talks about in his uh, financial, uh, the money master of the game, what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. He's doing exactly, or he's doing exactly what you're describing or uh, you're doing what he's describing but uh, yeah, um, yeah fasc fascinating discussion and i love this um how can people contact you follow you reach out to you uh, check out your work etc yeah the the best place for people to go is to come hang out with me on my newsletter it's called life changer thinking and it's one framework one quote and one question that will help you upgrade your mind and create financial freedom in five minutes a week okay I love that. So if you want to come hang out with me there, just go to Sterling. It's my first name, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G dot blog. Just go to Sterling dot blog and can't miss it. Join me there. And then um, if you want to hang out on social media, the places I hang out most are Twitter, which is now X, and then LinkedIn. It's just Sterling Griffin on both platforms. Yeah. Awesome. I really enjoyed your uh, enthusiasm and the way you described these concepts, building wealth. Um for all the audience out there, uh, Sterling's resources will be in the links and show notes. Got a fantastic story. Check out all of his social media. And with that, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me, brother. I hope you really enjoyed that wonderful, inspirational, motivational piece. Again, if you, wherever you are listening, if you liked it, be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. We're on everywhere, Spotify, iTunes, Google, Amazon, Audible. And without much ado, be sure to thank this show's sponsors, and we'll see you next week.